speaker will speak for about a half hour or so. We'll uh, keep the floor open for, for Q&A as we go along. Uh, Jim has uh, said he's more than happy to uh, take questions in the middle of the presentation if you have something that uh, that you think would uh, be important to ask at that point. Otherwise, you can hold the questions to the end and we'll, uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end. A um, couple things with LA2M. For most of you that know that uh, we are a nonprofit organization and we are, uh, we are dependent upon people like you guys coming here and our sponsors. Uh, this month we are again sponsored by the Digital Marketing Workshop that's being put on by the Center for uh, Digital Engagement at Eastern Michigan. Um, we're usually having Bud Gibson and he would have been here today, but he is doing last minute preparations for the, for the workshop. It is sold out, so hopefully those of you guys that, uh, that already got the email previously and, and promoted last month uh, with the special LA2 code bought your tickets because it is sold out. And it's going to be a great presentation. It's this Friday uh, at the EMU Convocation Center. Uh, I think it starts, uh, the doors open at 7.30. It goes to 2 p.m. Uh, they've got great speakers lined up. Um, if you've gone before, you know the presentation. It, it, it's a really well-run uh, workshop. So we appreciate the Digital Marketing Workshop uh, sponsoring uh, LA2M. Uh, if any of you are interested in sponsorships for uh, future months, please see me. We'd be happy to. If you'd like to promote your company, uh, or, or something, an event that you have going on, we'd love to have you uh, sponsor LA2M. So please see me and we'll, we'll do that. Um, I think unless anyone has any uh, initial announcements that you'd like to make, I'm gonna let Jim take over here. Um, we're very fortunate today to have Jim Berline from uh, Berline, uh, Berline Group, correct Jim? Whatever. Okay. <laughs> we'll answer it anyway. Yes, okay, so we're very fortunate. We're going to be talking about the value of branding, and, and I know from uh, doing marketing in the past how, and probably all of you know, how important branding is, uh, not just as a company for ourselves, because we're all a brand as well. So we're very fortunate. I'm going to turn it over to Jim and let him talk, and uh, we'll hopefully have a nice intimate interaction session today, and uh, we'll do Q&A at the end. So please help me welcome Jim Berline. here um, and uh, as he said let's make this interactive so the more more conversation we get going uh, the more informative it's going to be for you and the more table value uh, there will be what struck me when I got here was how small the world is um, I uh, played football here 64 to 68 I was talking to Stacy well, my dad played football here and when did he play football here well he was he played football here from 64 to 68 what was his name? Uh, and we were buddies. So Stacy's dad was a teammate of mine the whole time I was here. Uh, and he was uh, one tough hombre. So <laughs> I'm glad he's on my team rather than the other team. <laughs> and then this guy walks in, his fraternity brother. Uh, we were both uh, Sigma Chi's. So the world really got small. Uh, so welcome, Tomo. And, uh, and tell your mom hi, Stacy. I will. OK, please do. Okay. Send me the picture. Okay. <laughs> Send me the picture too because I need it. Um, what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about branding and I tried to uh, structure, structure this in a way that it would have some take home value. Um, when you go on Google and you go on the internet and, and you put questions in about branding, you get all these flow charts that come right out of the business schools. And it's, it's all really impressive and everybody's got their own flow chart process. But when it comes down to really creating brands in the marketplace, there's much more logic and common sense involved in, 
in how you create a brand for yourself and the companies you represent and the products you try and sell. And I want to tell you a little story about my first exposure to branding because it relates back to sports. And most of the lessons that I have learned over the, over the years relate to my, my sports involvement. But I came from a little town in Ohio and uh, I'd never played in a losing football game. The helmet I wore from the time I put on a helmet in seventh grade through Michigan was always a winged helmet. So I've never had a helmet on that didn't have the Michigan wings on it. And when I finished high school, we'd won 47 straight games. So I'd never even played the game that we lost. I had no clue what you did after you lost the football game. And so I was expecting when I got to Ann Arbor that I was just going to kick butt and had great success. And I was a wide receiver. Uh, so when I got here, uh, we started the two-a-day practices. I, I was never open. I, I had no success. These guys were too good. They, I wasn't used to this kind of competition. And one day after practice, the, uh, the coach at the time, Bob Elliott, called me over and said, here's the problem. You don't look like a wide receiver. Your, your socks are hanging down. Your, your pants aren't pulled up high. You don't have wristbands on. You don't have the black stuff on your eyes. You don't look like you're fast. So these guys are going to be all over you. So I said, Dan, what should I do? And he said, well, do what I just told you to do. Pull the socks up so they're way up on your calves. And pull your pants up so your legs look longer. Put the stuff under your eyes and put your wrist stuff on. And you're going to look like you're fast. <laughs> you're not going to be any faster, but you're going to look like you're fast. So the next day I did that, and I came to practice. And the same guys that were guarding me backed up like three steps. I don't know if they thought I did that night. But all of a sudden, I was open on my pass. <laughs> And I was having great success again. And it taught me that it had nothing to do with my scale and my ability. It had to do with how people perceived me. And it taught me a lesson about branding, that it doesn't really matter how good you are or what your product has to offer. It's how people perceive it. And that's the way they're going to behave, and that's what's going to react to you. And that was a real important lesson for me. So as I work with clients now, perception is just critical to behavior and whether people want to accept your product or your service or you as a person or whether they're going to reject it. Because I make decisions very early on in the process. So I'm going to try and do this in very simplistic terms. And please interrupt me along the way if it doesn't make sense. My job here, my job and what I do at my advertising agency is to try and build brands and change behavior and have people do something different than they were going to do before they saw the work that we're doing on behalf of our clients. Everybody has a banking relationship or goes to a different doctor or a hospital or a casino, wherever it might be. And my job is to convince them that whatever they're doing is wrong. They gotta go to the one the client that I represent and I gotta convince them to change their behavior. And that has to do with branding. So you as people need to decide what your brand is. Because all of us have brands and uh, signals. And people make perceptions about us as a brand. You've got to think of yourself as a product, and you need to think of the people that you represent as a product. So the product that you try and sell is a product, you are a product, and the company that you work for or the companies that you represent are products and they're brands. And you have to think in terms of how you're going to change the perception of those brands to whomever their audiences are so that you have the outcome that you want to have. So the first thing you need to do is identify what your brand is. Because when we started our agency, we did like a perceptual map. You know, everybody know what a perceptual map is? So what we did was we decided on a map, we just put some axes. And, and one extreme was like pragmatic and the other was creative. And uh, one was uh, strategic and the other was intuitive. And we tried to say, OK, what do we want to be to place us on a map? And then we decided, what are we based on perception? put us on a map, and then we try to put our competition on the map, and then decide where's the biggest opportunity, and what do we need to do to move our brand to where the opportunity was. And it, and it became a pretty e easy visual exercise. But we had to identify what we wanted to be when we grew up, and how it was different from what we were at that time. Once we did that, then we had to, yes? Do you, do you actually like quantify that sort of Quantify the points 
Oh, well, you'd quantify it in terms of if the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, if the opportunity is there, you can say, okay, is there business there? Because we could be something where nobody else is, but if there's no business there, it doesn't matter. Right. And so you can quantify it in my business in terms of what the billing opportunities are to find clients in that space. I think I might quantify the dimensions of the attributes that you were talking about. Are we creative or pragmatic? Yeah, if you, yeah, if you do research, you can quantify it or put yourself on the scale. Yeah. We, we, did, we just sat down and put a whiteboard up and decided what, what we were going to be. About two years after that, we did. We hired an industrial psychologist, and they came in and spent about two days with us, interviewed all of our employees, interviewed the owners, and then they did a report of what kind of company we had created and asked us not to react to the report for like a week because it probably said things we didn't want to hear, and they didn't want us to act impulsively. And it really, it told us that we had to make some decisions and changes in our management because the management of the company under us was not delivering the promise that we were expecting to be delivered. So we were not creating the brand that we wanted to create, we assumed we were. So they also told us that the people we had doing that were not capable of delivering that brand. They didn't have the intellectual horsepower, or they didn't have the emotional engagement in terms of human relations to deliver it. So we made, we, we actually terminated over about six months all the senior management in the, in the firm uh, to find people who could deliver the promise and the brand that we wanted to create. Uh, and, it, and it was the right thing to do. It was a hard thing to do, but it was easy to do in a young company when that's kind of the expectation. There's a high risk. Once those people have been with you 10, 12 years, it's a little harder because then you've got a vested interest in their mortgage and their kids and whatever else, and those are bigger decisions. So once you get the brand and you identify what it is, then you've got to keep refining it because the world's changing uh, every day as you go. And if you don't change with it, then uh, that's the beginning of the end. So the refinement of the brand make, forces you to keep taking a look at it and, and it's the same way with yourself. If you don't refine who you are, then the world's gonna change and you're gonna be out of luck at some point. And usually in this world, it's gonna be sooner than later. Then you gotta decide how to enhance your, enhance your brand. Because just trying to refine it requires change. But unless you enhance it, it doesn't create more value. And you need to have value for the companies that you represent. You need to have value for yourself to make yourself a better brand. So at the end of the day, you don't have any regrets. And that's, yes? Hmm? I'm sorry, ask you to go back a little bit. Sure. Can you just give us a one-sentence definition of what a brand is? Because we're, we're talking about building something, but I'm not sure I understand what we're supposed to be building. I want to make sure that I'm on the same page. So in one sentence, is there a way to say, this is what a brand is and this is what a brand does? Well, what a brand is, is what you are in fact. What, what you provide, what your service is, or what your, what your function is. So is it a, is it a message? Uh, uh, no, a message is an expression of a brand. So, so I have a logo is an expression of a brand. A okay. theme line is an expression of a brand. A message, a creative platform is an expression of a brand. But those are all intended to communicate what the brand is to whoever is in okay. So it's more the perception? Yeah. It's, it's more what is heard versus what is spoken. Yeah, what is I mean, you might be a PhD in nuclear physics, and if you don't sound like a talk like it, you don't tell me that, I might perceive you to be a kindergarten teacher. Somehow you've got to communicate your brand, otherwise I'm going to misperceive what you are. And so it depends how you want me to perceive you and how you want to create your brand. If you want me to perceive you as a PhD nuclear physicist, you have to communicate to me through messaging and through the way you talk and act and the questions you and what you do in the society that'll reinforce that brand. If you don't, then you're going to create a misperception. And that's why people fail. But typically, one, one day I did, I think I did what you had asked. I went somewhere and spoke and I asked people to write a piece of paper with the thought of brand was. And it came back like 20 different times. It came back, one person said a theme line, somebody said a logo, somebody said the product itself. 
but it was never actually what I was perceived to be. And and that's really what a brand is. Coke has a brand, so it has a brand because you perceive it to have a certain benefit to you, a certain image to you. Uh, and companies that succeed are the ones that have a clear brand image, but they also have they're able to uh, satisfy their expectation through whatever experience you have with it. So it's more than a name. Yeah. I mean, it's a brand name, but not brand. Until you. Mm. Yeah. So would it be accurate? The election is on my brain, and I think about Trump. To me, the reason why Trump won, his brand was changed. Would that be accurate? That that's what, that's where people connected with him was on the change level? Or would that not be what you would consider? What would you consider Donald Trump's? brand, I guess. That's a very good question. Because um, I see it as change. I was just thinking, like, as you were talking, like, I saw Trump as change based on what I was seeing. Well, I think that would be, you'd say that would be the, if you were an advocate, you'd say that was a benefit of his brand, that, that it won't be a status quo, that his brand will initiate change, and the world won't be like it is after, you know, he takes over and starts to leave us. But I think his brand is much more confusing than that. Uh, and I'm not sure I understand his brand. Uh, well, I was hoping you would provide that for me. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he knows what his brand is. What about Obama? What's his brand? Everybody has a very clear image of what his niche is 
and it's always focused. Everybody refers to him in the same way, for the same ways, whether it's a movie or a book or just reference to a cinema. It's always focused on that, in that niche. You're right, that's very clear. Right. I mean, there are a couple of folks here starting to grind from the side. Yeah. It's a separate from the team. It's part of the team, but it also his brand is bigger than being coached in the university. I'm a jerk with a brand, not just a basketball player, it's a brand. You attach value to a brand. Your brand. Your brand was a brand. Who would pay five cents for that job? <laughs> He's trying to draw a brand for himself. So he has to make sure that the brand you create is one that, if, if, if your measurement's going to be commercial success, then it's got to be desired by the market. Pure Michigan. Pure Michigan brand. Yeah, but that was that's a different kind of brand in that it took millions of dollars and lots of time because it was a quiet expression of the brand and it had quite a seed and then you had to get immersion and then you looked forward to the next expression and they kept it fresh. But it wasn't one of those after two months you said, boy, that's the greatest thing I ever did. It took a while. Does that answer it? Yeah. Sorry. No. And then the next thing is, once you know what your brand is, then it's, it's, it's a commitment to sustain it. And that's where a lot of commercial companies lose sight because they, they don't want to compete or continue to put resources behind it. Or they don't make it part of the culture of the company so that everybody on the team is, is marching in the same direction. So sustaining things is really critical. And then it's continuing continuing to look at those brands and as you sustain them, continue to enhance them. Because the world changed and you can't be the same thing forever. So this is the, like the analogy, I, I make it very simple terms when I'm talking to newer people in the business, that we all start as hamburger. We're just raw meat. So anybody can buy a hamburger. We do a lot of Wendy's business, which is why hamburger is the analogy. But there's nothing distinguishing about a hamburger. So whether we're a person, or whether we're representing a client, or the company we work for, how are we gonna make us more than hamburger? And our goal is to become something more than just the basic hamburger, so that we start to distinguish ourselves from our competition. And the ideal thing is, this will get you to middle management, but the ideal thing is not to be hamburger anymore and it's become a filet. Because that has value. People will pay 40 bucks for this, and the other one, you're going to be in a price war, and you're going to end up at, at Blumpy Burgers uh, for a buck nine instead of 34, and you have to think of yourself as the same. But do I want to be a hamburger? Do I want to be a bacon cheeseburger? Or do I want to be a, a filet? And do I want my clients that I represent to be thought of this way because I can make more money for them and I become more indispensable. So if I'm a person, the hamburger, the minute you lose a piece of business, you're the first one to get fired because you have no inherent value or benefit to stay on. If you're the bacon cheeseburger, you got a good chance of surviving some cutbacks, but you're probably never going to get to the corner office. But the, the filet is the one that's going to get to the C-suite. They're going to be the COO, the CEO, the CFO, the CTO, whatever the, the executive positions are, because they did what needed to be done to get to make themselves a filet rather than just a hamburger. So what you what you offer has to become a differentiator. So when you talk to people uh, in business. And you say, are you doing a good job? Or what are the, who are the people that work for you that are really valuable? Well, they tend, they say, oh, they're the ones that always get their work done on time. They're really responsive. I give them a job, and I ask for it Friday, and they get it done Thursday. Well, that's really cool. It's always on time. If I give them a budget, they're always on budget or they're under budget, which is another great criteria. They're always efficient, and they don't make mistakes. 
So too many people think that makes me qualified to, for the C-suite. But that's just the minimum to play the game. These are minimum attributes just to be employed. And too many people think if I do everything on time and on, on budget and faster than he asked for it and it's really efficient, I had to get a promotion. No, that's not the case. Differentiated, differentiators are things like the ability to build relationships. Ultimately, the people who win in competition are the ones who understand human relationships. Because people are buying people. They're buying people they trust. They're buying people they want to spend time with. They trust with information. They trust their opinion. I can tell a client who trusts me, he has a stupid idea, and I'm not worried about getting fired. I can't tell somebody I don't have a relationship with that stupid idea. And somebody that I have a good relationship with can tell me my idea is stupid and not worry about offending me because that's the kind of relationship we have. Since we started our agency, this is the, our 34th one, I've never made a cold new business call in 34 years. Virtually every client that we have came through a referral came through some kind of a recommendation from a client where we earned a relationship. And that became the differentiator between us and our competition. Trust, every time we get a new client, I'll ask the client, why did they pick us? Because they, they met with six other agencies or 10 other agencies. And they might say, well, somebody else had a more clever idea, or we really like the account person over there, but, or this other person said they could buy media well but we trusted you. We trusted you with our company, we trusted you with our brand, we trusted you that you would do whatever it takes to make our company successful. So that's really fundamental. And that's what you want to do as a person. That should be your personal brand, is to become someone that other people trust and that you want to have a relationship with that's beyond just short term. Another attribute is being able to be proactive. Once you just become somebody who takes orders and does them well, there's lots of places people can go to get their order filled. But what people will pay for are people who bring them ideas they can't think of themselves. And those are differentiators. Those are the last ones to get fired in a cutback. When I use the football analogy again, if you're gonna, the team's got 75 players and they're gonna cut to 50, the guy who can catch a pass and throw a pass and kick field goals is the last one they're going to cut because there's three bodies in one. So you got to think of yourself in that kind of a way. What can I do to make myself a filet and how many different skills can I have that make me indispensable to my clients and to the company I work for? And keep thinking of yourself as a brand in that respect that I'm constantly evaluated against other people. How am I differentiating myself? The strategic is another one. A lot of people will, uh, can do tactical things. A lot of people can't think strategically. Clients pay for people who think strategically because those are problem solvers and those are people who can be proactive. Lots of places a client can go and have somebody buy media or somebody lay out an ad or, or, or somebody uh, I write a PR release. But there's not a lot of places they can go when somebody says, that's not what you want to be doing. Here's the strategy, here's what you should be doing to move your business forward and to satisfy the goal that you said was the goal for yourself or for your company. And again, that's a differentiator. And you gotta be smart. Because there's a lot of expectation from clients and you gotta understand their business. You gotta understand what are the triggers in their business and what, again, what's gonna help them be more successful. And, and, and smart people can do that. There's lots of data available. And you gotta have the initiative to go find the data, interpret it, and then use it in your strategic thinking. We kinda bring things down to the, the, the basic level and we have this philosophy we call the I'll be damned philosophy. And what we try and do is when a client comes to us where they are going to have a presentation. What we want their reaction to be when they leave together and get in the elevator and go down, they say to one another, oh, damn, because they exceeded what their expectation. 
we went there thinking we were going to see the new campaign, new headlines, blah, blah, blah. But they gave us 20% more. And what happens is over time, your brand keeps getting refined and enhanced because the next time they come to you, they're going to say, this better be an Albie Dam meeting because they got one last time. So it forces us to work harder to keep being Albie Dam. And it and allows the client to have, keep raising the bar on their expectations. And what that does is it builds more trust and it enhances the relationship. And I think you need to do that as a people as well. Because when you see them, work with the same people every day, oh, they're the ones that do this. And what you want them to do is, is be a little bit more uneasy. You want them not, you don't want to be quite so predictable in how you attack problems. Because again, that adds value to you. And the more valuable you are, the more money you can make, the more security you have. So minimum attributes, all those things I talked about, responsiveness and efficient, all those, those are easily replaceable. Clients go anywhere to get those things done. But the differentiators are indispensable. And that's what you want to be, and that's what you want to make the clients you represent, the company you work for, you want them to become indispensable the customers that are, are going to make uh, or pay you money. The other thing I learned early on was you always need an angel. And I, when I first got in the agency business, I had the, the opportunity to meet the publisher of Newsweek. But for some reason, we got along really well. And he would give me these life lessons. And one lesson he gave me one day was, you got to have an angel. Wherever you're working, whenever you're thinking about changing careers, Whenever you need somebody who's going to protect your interest, have a person before you make a big decision. Um, and I had this person, and I didn't follow their advice one time, and it was a bad decision. I didn't have an angel when I went there. And ever since then, I've, I've decided when I make a big decision, I'm going to make sure I have an angel. I want an angel on the client side, where they're going to pick us, so that I don't get judged because of somebody doesn't like one headline, they think I'm a bad agency. I have somebody there that is going to protect our brain. Uh, when I make decisions personally, I want to make sure I have somebody I can go to to give them the facts and they can give me an objective point of view. You should have one of those people in the company you work for. He said, whenever you're with a big company and you get transferred, you better have an angel who's going to make sure that if it doesn't work out and they send you to London, you're not going to be stranded in London. You're going to, that angel is going to get you back here. Or, or they're going to take a risk with you and put you in some other division. It's the startup division. And we're going to try and get good at X. And if that X doesn't work, are you going to be left out? Or is the angel going to make sure that they bring you back and, and you're protected? So having an angel is really critical in the business world. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. How do you get the angel? Is that someone you respect? Is that someone that finds you? Is that someone that you just feel comfortable bouncing those ideas off of or the advice that you want to get? It, it's, it's kind of all those. Okay. It's not, typically it's not somebody in the company that you work for. Uh, the, 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 where I made a mistake was, uh, I was an exec vice president of BBDO, and BBDO lost the Chrysler business when I and Coca came over. And, so I, I had like 400 people working for me, and I had Coca called one day and said they're all fired. And 30 seconds, they had the business for like 34 years. And I'm going to hang up, and I'm going to call Younger Rubicon, I'm going to fire them, and then I call Russ Wood and fire them. And that's the way a 34-year relationship ended in less than 30 seconds. And so I decided that this is, uh, there's got to be something different about, about that. So I had an opportunity to go to YNR in New York, and I met the, uh, uh, the president of YNR as part of the interview process, and he played football at Rutgers. So I thought, okay, there's my bond. I played football here, and I've always got a guy I can go talk to. Well, wrong. Uh, so I went to this Harvard program that they had where they were going to evaluate their candidates, and I was the highest level person they'd hired from outside YNR. So I represented a new culture, we're going to go outside to find talent rather than just all the potion from within. So I, I succeeded in the program and I was waiting to see at the end, am I going to get the Dr. Pepper account or the Delta Airlines or Visa or what am I going to work on? And he called me in his office and said, we have a problem. 
that six of our senior vice presidents resigned because of you. Because of you? Yeah. And I said, what did I do? And they said, because you represent, we were changing our culture. We were going to go to the outside to find talent now, rather than if you stayed here long enough, you got, you got promoted. And I said, what does that mean for me? Because I'm a house for sale in Birmingham. I bought a house in Westport. My wife was pregnant. And I said, you're telling me the largest privately owned agency in the world. I just screwed it up because I did your program pretty well. And I said, you're crazy. The inmates are running your asylum here. I'm out of here. And you just bought a house in Westport, Connecticut. And the profit sharing program, I walked away from a BBDO. You just have to make it good again. And blah, blah, blah. So it all got taken care of. But I misjudged who my angel was. And I just based it on the fact that the guy played football. And it had nothing to do with it. What, had, what the common bond was, I didn't go to an Ivy League school. I wasn't from the East Coast. and go to prep schools. And that was where his, his frame of reference was. And I was outside that. It wasn't sports. It was my upbringing. So I think what you got to do is you got to find somebody in some business that you trust, that they can be objective, and that they understand you and what's going to make you happy. Um, and it could be a lawyer. It could be a school teacher. It could be anybody. But somebody who can distance himself from you, they know you, but they will look you in the eye and say, don't take that job. It isn't you. Or go for it. Pick up the kids, sell the house, go, because this is the big one. You need somebody like that who can trust. Um, and I've talked to a lot of my friends about that, and, and they, the odds are much better when you've got an angel that it's going to work out than when you don't have an angel and you make a bad decision. And you can waste a lot of time and heartache. This my dad taught me. My dad played football at Penn State, and he was a, uh, he got shot 11 times at the Battle of Anzio in Italy. He was the only guy that didn't get killed in that particular invasion. They thought he was dead, and the Italians saved him. There's a little footbridge in Anzio, Italy, called the Berlin Bridge that they named after him. But he taught me a lot of lessons. He played tight end for Penn State. He was like 6'4", lost both of his legs, and he said he was 5'5 five five then. Uh, but one of those tough guys that was written about in the, in the, uh, the Brokaw's book. But anyway, he kept telling me this the whole time I grew up. Anytime I had success, never tell people that you're good. Never tell them that you know what you're doing. Let them tell you that you're good and let them tell you that you know what you're doing. Then you become valuable. And it's the people who are around pounding their chest are the ones that other people want to help them fail. They want to prove that they don't, aren't as good as they think they are. But if they're telling you you're really good, they're going to help you in that position. So it was a great thing that I keep reminding myself. That, um, and when I see people like Mr. Trump, I always say, what would my dad think about Mr. Trump? <laughs> uh, but you know, his brand, will, you know, we'll see. Over the years, I've, I've been able to identify characteristics for people who always succeed. OK. And those that tend to fall off the train at some point. The first thing, and maybe the most important common element that people have is that they are innately competitive. They love to keep score. They love metrics. They love measurables. And they're not intimidated by it. When, when you look at somebody and you say, we're going to measure your performance at the end of the month, and their eyes start spinning, that's probably not the one you want. But when they say, well, let me at it, and that's all you want me to do at the end of a month, no problem. You need to innately love competition. And that's why at our company we hire a lot of ex-athletes, we hire a lot of people who are dancers or, or bands because they learned how to practice and practice and practice and then perform. And if it was a bad performance, they learned how to do it better the next time. And if it was a great performance, they said, what did I do right? I'm going to keep repeating what I did right. The next thing is that they're collaborative. They understand how to be part of a team. So at our company, I and me, you never hear. It's always we and us. And it's the same way with our clients. We want them to think of us as an extension of our, their team. 
and not, when they use the word vendor or supplier, I get like chills because it's not going to be the right attitude. We want them to feel like we're just an extension of them. That's when they share things with us. That's when they respect each other's opinion. That's when they trust us. It's hard to trust a vendor or a supplier, and it's easy to trust a partner. And people understand collaboration do that. Talked about smart, got to be bright. Passionate is another key ingredient. If you don't get excited for what you're doing and excited about um, the work you're doing, uh, and when you get up every day, you don't get excited about going doing it, bad deal. I don't want those people on my team. And I don't think they'd want me on their team if I wasn't passionate. Every day, it's a new day. The contrary to that is people have to be sensitive because you're dealing with lots of human beings who have problems. Everybody doesn't have a perfect day. And you've got to be the rudder in the ship. I know at my company, people don't know whether I just got, we just lost our biggest account or we just gained a $100 million account because they try and do the same every day. So if they've got somebody they can count on every day. If I'm erratic, then they're going to be erratic. And they've got to have the, the, the rock in the corner. But people who are sensitive can, can understand and appreciate creative. Because a strategy is one thing, but an expression of that strategy takes some certain uh, human sensitivity. And people who are insensitive to other people tend to be more successful. And then the last thing, particularly in this day and age, you've got to be fearless. There's no job you, you're afraid of or intimidated by. Just go, go get them. And if you have those characteristics, you're probably going to be successful. You're probably going to be in the, in the corner office someday, or at least you're going to be very, very successful, both, both in terms of commercial uh, measurements, but also personally. You'll be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, I did what I could do with my life. And at the end of the day, there are no regrets. And let me leave you with one more thought. Uh, I, I went to Alaska with a couple of guys uh, a few years ago, and we were flying around this bush pilot, and he said, uh, he was really intelligent, had an English accent, his wife worked in Washington, I said, why are you flying us around with the fish? And he said, because I, he had like a PhD from somewhere, and he said, because I, at, at the end of the day, when I'm walking down the street and a little kid on his front porch yells at me and says, mister, what did you do? He said, I want to go sit down with that little kid and say to him, you're not going to believe it. And then be able to tell that kid what I did with my life. And I came home from that trip and I told my wife, I said, it's a new game. We're going to stop measuring our success by acquisition. It's all going to be based on experience. So at the end of the day, did we go to the Galapagos? Did we do this? Did we, our bucket list is going to be different. To, do I have a Rolex? Do I have a sports car? Do I have a home up north and one down in Naples? And it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do to help other people, and, it, and, it, and what matters is what you're able to experience in the time that you're here. And it's why a good part of what I do with my time is, is working with not-for-profits. Um, and the biggest game cha changer was when I granted a wish to a, a little girl who's dying and uh, would make a wish. Changed, changed everything. Uh, when I walked her through it, and ultimately she passed away, and, and a book was written about it, traveled with her mom and dad. But priorities get changed when you experience something like that. And so as you think about your brand, think about what you want your measurables to be, think what you want your experience to be at the end of the day, and think about what you can give back and help other people. So. I rambled a little bit. I, I hope that gives you some insight. I'm glad to answer any other questions you might have. Hey, join me in thank you. I guess we have a minute or so for a phone call. I'm sorry. For a question. Did it live up to my head? Yeah, question. So, when you were interviewing or the process of bringing people in, how did you find the differentiators? What was your process or what led you to know somebody was the right? Well, early on we just had a couple of people interview and we made some mistakes. Uh, a couple up there are hard to find out in an interview. It's hard to find out if somebody's just innately competitive. 
other than what, what, they, what do they do when they're not in the office? What do they do to get there? Uh, 